those words, Clarion Borough Council President Ron Wilshire finished a meeting that lasted over two hours. The meeting held discuss Clarion University's request for a conditional use variance for lots along Greenville Avenue and Corbett Street. We stand ready to work with the borough and the citizens in the area in any way possible. The plan as outlined by Reinhardt will come about in two phases. The first phase would add 100 spots for on-campus students, and phase two would provide parking for visitors and events. Borough residents who live by the proposed parking areas came to the meeting with concerns about security, drainage, and traffic and student flow. If the university keep purchasing lots, you're going to drive the owner, taxpayer, out of the city. <laughs> I don't want to go. I want to live in Clarence. So therefore, I'm not in favor of the variance. Thank you. Uh, and, it, and then these people get a letter saying, well, we're going to propose this and we're going to do that. Why wasn't the neighborhood informed before any of this was even drawn up or even talked about? Why didn't they talk to these neighbors before any of this ever started to place? Following the public portion of the meeting, Council discussed two motions of Councilman Jim Crooks to proceed with the university project. Neither was second and thus did not proceed. After further discussion, it was decided that Council President Will Shire and Council Member William Miller would abstain due to their employment by Clarion University. I'm disqualifying myself from taking a vote on this because I, earlier this summer, attempted to purchase one of these pieces of property. If I vote against it, or now they decide not to buy it and the real estate agent comes back to me and says this property is available do you want to buy it no. <laughs> is there anyone left second with a long box after further discussion other members of council expressed their concern that they are not comfortable voting on the issue at this time and that this meeting was adjourned and the issue will be discussed at another time Travelers of Route 68 west of Clarion will be driving on a new roadway in a few years. PennDOT is working to replace this bridge that was ruined due to 1996 flooding. A temporary bridge is in place, but other improvements are in the works. And we are replacing that structure, plus doing a realignment of 68 to alleviate the bad curves around this bridge. When this project is completed, this bridge will no longer exist, but rather the water will flow through concrete tunnels some 40 feet under the new roadway. Some may wonder how projects like this take shape. Local citizens groups like the Clarion County Route 68 Improvement Committee help to bring road projects to fruition. Uh, we um, formed a group with the idea that we believe that in order for uh, improved economic development conditions to um, develop, we needed a good highway system and we did not feel Route 68 presented a very good highway system to develop economic development. So we decided one of our first goals was going to be to try to improve the, the Route 68 highway. This group takes their proposals to PennDOT and in fact will be at a PennDOT hearing tomorrow morning presenting more road improvement suggestions. I know a lot of people at times don't think PennDOT is very responsive, but we found them to be very interested in meeting with us and talking with us and listening to our input. In fact, we can say so far is that the, the uh, body of a uh, uh, young white male uh, was found uh, in an academic building, uh, found dead in an academic building on campus. That information from Public Safety Director Dave Tajeski came just hours after Clarion University Public Safety Officers responded to a call at Pierce Science Center. <coughs> Their moves, I mean, it was just kind of like dismal. They said, please don't look, just, just keep walking. And as I walked towards the library, there were probably, I mean, little chunks of, of people, of you know, students, like all through, and uh, maybe about five or ten, ten students per group, all just looking on their faces. I mean, people that you would never expect. To, I mean, even like, I mean, you generalize and see people on campus that don't really show any emotion, and even these guys were pretty shaken up. I mean, it's hard not to be shaken up something like this. So. 
As last night progressed, details were sketchy and officials were not releasing any information until sometime after 11 when we were informed that indeed a shot was fired. Uh, all indications at this point lead us to believe he has died as a result of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Overnight, new details emerged with confirmation that state police are now handling the investigation. But the bigger news that was released was the name of the victim, Brian J. Rathbon, a former Clare University student from Leeper. Other details came out at a press conference held this morning. First and foremost, I'd like to say on behalf of the entire Clarion University community that we express our deepest sympathy to the family of Brian Rathbun. Uh, it's a deep tragedy for the family, and I hope you all keep the family in your thoughts and prayers. According to university officials, Rathbun was a former Clarion University student who was last enrolled in the fall of 97. He was enrolled as a business management major, but never completed his degree. According to a family friend I spoke with, he left the university to enroll in a PGA golf school. State police indicated that there was a suicide note and then elaborated further. Uh, there, he, he had a correspondence. That's as far as we want to get at this point in time. As of this morning, students resume their regular class schedule in Pierce and other university buildings. Classes are continuing in Pierce. Um, there is a section of, of that lobby that is still um, not open to the public. The 46th annual Autumn Leaf Festival kicked off this past weekend with its usual wide variety of foods and activities. You can still find your favorite events that return each year, but there are also some new things to check out, especially food stock, which benefits Clarion County food banks. Starts at 5 o'clock Thursday and continues on a 24-hour marathon until 5 o'clock on Friday. So we're urging everybody who comes into town to bring at least one non-perishable food item to food stock 99 because it's a great benefit. Well, the rain did arrive late this afternoon, but that didn't put in dampering on any of the festival's events. Pretty ominous right right now, yeah. Um, we've really lucked out so far, though, because they were calling for rain earlier in the week, and it's been passing us. And actually, I just uh, spoke with a weather center, and they said that it's actually going a little bit north of us, so maybe we'll just catch the tail end, and it'll rain tonight, get it all out of the way, and the rest of the week looks really good. Once the rain did stop this afternoon, people came out to enjoy all that Autumn Leaf has to offer. We're here for lunch today. The rain couldn't hold you back. No. <laughs> so what are you going to have for lunch today? Wings today. Wings. Yeah. That's a favorite of everyone. Yeah, I worked the hot dog cart at St. Joe's. Oh, St. Okay. Joe's uh, school. I'll be working that on the parade day. Oh. But visitors aren't the only ones who get caught up in the action of ALF. The food vendors have fun, too. And I like the parade. That's my favorite. That's our busiest time, but that's my favorite. Uh -huh. For most residents and students in Clarion, ALF week is a tradition that can't come soon enough each year. How many years have you been coming here? Four. Is this your last one then? Yeah, it's uh, my last one. <laughs> so is it kind of nostalgic now for you? Yeah. It's just, I live right there, so it's like my front yard. You come to the parade? Oh, you come to everything when yeah. you live in Clarion, and it's out for you. <laughs> student concerns. If and when there's a strike, uh, the university will remain open. Those words answer a lot of questions and speculation that has been going on around the Clarion University campus over the last few weeks. But new details came out this past weekend when contract talks between the state system of higher education and APSCA, the faculty union, broke down Saturday night. Among the new information from Saturday, we found out that the parties are now apart on about a dozen issues. Also, the APSCUF team recommended that the APSCUF president is allowed to call a work stoppage when he deems it necessary. According to APSCUF, binding arbitration was once again offered, but received no response from the state system. But back to the big question that's on students' minds. What will happen on campus? 
we're planning to uh, leave the university uh, classrooms open for professors who choose to do so to, to uh, still teach at the university. We are planning to keep the other parts of the university open. The residence halls will be open. The dining hall will be open. Another question that I posed to Mr. Wilshire was the question of what will happen if the strike lasts for an extended amount of time. Right now the system is uh, planning to keep the universities open. In case of a prolonged strike, uh, other options would be looked at, such as Saturday classes or extending the semester. But we want to make sure that the students uh, continue to receive their education. suspect of any illegal activity taking place in Clarion County? Well, if you do, the Clarion County Sheriff's Office wants you to tell them about it. Thank you for using time. The Sheriff's tip line. We are interested in your tips, so please give as many details as possible on the subject you're calling about. Also, we may want to gather additional information, and if you wish, please tell us how to contact you. But remember, you do not have to leave your name if you don't wish to. Please take your time and leave your message at the sound of the tone. What you just heard was the Clarion County Sheriff's Tips Hotline at 226-TIME, which is designed to help stop crime in Clarion. Well, I, I think any avenue that's uh, open to the public that encourages them to have input in, in, in their government uh, offices is worthwhile, and that's what I'm hoping to get is that the public who at large know of maybe of a crime that has occurred or about to occur or have some information, and they want to do it anonymously, and this is one way they can do that. They can call With a simple toot of the horn, students and residents are showing their support for faculty at Clarion University. In recent weeks, we have heard a lot of talk about the possibility of a faculty strike at the 14 state system of higher education schools. Well, today, students came out to voice their opinions on the contract talks. I wish all the students would come out because it's going to affect them if they go on strike too. It's not just us right here, it's the whole campus, the whole state system. As you can see behind me, students are demonstrating in front of the university's administrative building to show their support for ABSCO. The student demonstration took place between 9 and 4 today, and according to the organizer, provided a forum for students to express their views on the contract negotiations. This is my education. I'm a consumer. This is big business. And I would like to get my education. I'd like to get what I'm paying for. The demonstration took place outside of Carrier Hall in order to let the Clarion administration and community know that the students support the faculty. I spoke with Clarion University President Dr. Diane Reinhardt about her reaction to the demonstration. I, I believe that students have the right to, to, to say to the public and to their colleagues, students, how they feel about um, the negotiations. And so I think that, that that's a, a right and um, a responsibility that students have. I am optimistic about negotiations. I hope that they will be uh, coming to a, a conclusion, a successful conclusion within this two-week time frame that we have. Um, and I, I
For those of you who are on the Clearing University campus daily, I'm sure you've seen a lot of construction. Well, this week, all of that construction is nearing completion as the new Student Recreation Center opens. We spoke with the new director of the center, Lori Sabatos, to get the scoop. Place to be. We're open 7 in the morning to 11 at night. They don't have to fight with any of the athletic teams because this is strictly for recreation and intramurals. So, you know, they make the request, they come down here, they can use it any time. You know. The center houses a weight room, which always seems to be full, climb wall, which isn't open yet, and the courts, which can be used for tennis, volleyball, and of course the most popular basketball. And there is also an indoor track for students to enjoy. A lot of people are using it. That's, a, again, the, the running track is open from 7 in the morning to 11 at night. And up here you see the cardio machines and stretch area for the track. The indoor track, which I'm on now, is one of the amenities that's made just for students. So how do students feel about the new rec center? Much nicer than what I had used to go to Tippin Gym. And it has so much more to offer than, than what it did than at Tippin. Like, there's so many more machines. It's really open. I really like how it's really spaced out. I especially like the track. Uh -huh. I mean, this way I don't have to run outside during the winter. <laughs> freeze, I can run in here. Nice. We took the opportunity to talk with students working this afternoon to get their reactions to the new recreation center. And it's like all the equipment's really new. So, I mean, it's like, it's fun to come here and just, you know, have a good time and work out. It's already day three and you love it, right? Yeah. <laughs> really, like, shocked about how big it is and how nice it is inside here. It's really nice. Yeah. I On Tuesday, Clarion County residents will be asked to vote for two county commissioners from the following candidates. David G. Seipert, Glenn L. Watson, Don R. Hartle, John S. Shropshire, Polly Weaver, and Vernon L. Etzel. Running for county prothonotary are Chris Baker and Mary Jane McCall. For registered recorder are Greg Mortimer and Lee A. Reimer. Running for county treasurer are Robert J. Lewis and Teresa M. Snyder. And for county district attorney are Ronald T. Elliott and Mark T. Aaron. Running for County Auditor are Ralph H. Minich, William Lennon, James C. Barger, and Gregory A. Fowler. Also on the ballot will be an official question, which reads as follows. The elected office of County Controller be established in Clarion County, Pennsylvania to replace the three elected county auditors. Running for Borough Council in Clarion Borough are S. Brad Leonard, Earl Zerfoss, and Joanne Vavrick. And running for Clarion Borough Assessor is Betty June Kinter. Election night in Clarion County proved to be one of the most exciting in recent years. Here is a recap of the results. The county commissioner race winners were Donna Hartle, receiving the most votes with 27%, followed by John Shropshire with 20%, and David Seipert receiving 17%, edging out Glenn Watson by merely 56 votes. Mary Jane McCall retained her position as prothonotary, winning well over half of the vote. In the register recorder race, Greg Mortimer retained his seat, winning almost three-quarters of the vote. In the county treasurer race, Teresa Snyder won with a large majority. The auditor's race showed a re-election of incumbents Ralph Minnick, James Barger, and Greg Fowler. Also on the ballot was a question that, if passed, could have changed the role of the three auditors into a single county controller. That referendum was voted against by two-thirds of the county voters. And in the five-county ride race, Mark Aaron defeated Ron Elliott in the county district attorney race. The morning of October 21st proved to be all too eventful for Rod Miller of Knox. Someone came in, cut a hole in the chain link fence, Probably darted the deer, Goliath. And Goliath, a prize 28-point buck, was reportedly taken somewhere between 3 and 5 a.m. on the night of October 20th. The buck, as seen here, was bought by Miller for his deer breeding farm, and he had no idea that the buck would turn into the extraordinary animal that is seen here. 
he was just phenomenal in his horn growth. He could, what he was doing, very, very few deer ever do. And uh, that's what makes him so special. He was one of a kind. Okay. That one of a kindness made Goliath attractive to be stolen. Whoever got him possibly is uh, drawing semen out of him or they're breeding their own does. And they're just going to go from there. Who knows what they're going to do, really? Okay. With a $25,000 reward now being offered and national magazines publicizing the disappearance of the deer, Miller hopes brighter days are around the corner. Well, with all the flyers and uh, different magazines we have it in, we're hoping someone will see it, someone that knows what happened or can piece uh, this together and possibly turn somebody in. Okay. Tomorrow's feedback goes in depth with the newly elected Clarion County Commissioners. The show, which was taped last night, explored some of the big issues facing Clarion today. Part of the uh, problem, I think, is it's tied to budget uh, and leadership, uh, but there is no direction. Uh, and it's pretty hard to uh, go somewhere if you don't really know where you want to go. And, uh, the, uh, and I think that uh, uh, that has been lacking. Uh, we're not uh, probably progressing in a uniform pattern. Uh, the incoming commissioners have vowed to work together as a team in order to create a better government. And I, I think you'll find that we're not always going to agree on the subject. But if there was no disagreement, there wouldn't be any leadership. Where the leadership is going to come when you find a team that has a disagreement can put that aside and go on with business. Tomorrow's another day. The chair of the incoming commissioners, Donna Hartle, said making the county better is the most important part of the job. And we all decided that this is what we have to do. We're going to t put politics aside and we're all going to get down to what is actually doing the best for the county. And One of the hottest topics in Clarion County politics this year has been the county jail. Donna Hartle spoke to that issue. I felt that this was putting the cart before the horse. Uh, you don't go into all of this extensive renovations at a very costly uh, price ticket and not know who's going to go in there. Issues and like the county jail and economic development were discussed by the commissioners. According to a recent survey by the Dead Counselors of America, 64% of Americans plan to spend as much or more on holiday gifts this year. I've already spent more. <laughs> already spent more. Well, I'm spending with the money that I have. I've earned more money so I can spend. Okay. Those people that we spoke with had mixed opinions about their holiday shopping, but most agreed that they would be using credit cards this year. We're shopping with our credit cards on the net. Does that, does that make you a little worrisome? That uh, not really, because everybody knows who we are anyway, so I'm not really worried. The sites that we use are secured sites, and okay. so we're not worried about it. Are uh, you going to be using credit cards this year at all? I will be using them, but not a lot. So with consumers doing more holiday shopping this year, you need to be cautious. And here's some tips to help. Debt Counselors of America made these suggestions for a happier holiday season debt-wise. Avoid those buy-now-pay-later offers. Use low-rate major credit cards. Record your credit card purchases in your checkbook. That way, when your bill arrives, the money will be in your checking account to pay the bill in full. And avoid skip payment offers, then in the long run, will cause you to pay more interest and have larger bills.
Election 99 proved to be one of the largest that Clarion County has seen in the last few years. The election of three new commissioners and the possibility of the three county auditors being replaced with a single county controller were the top issues this year. Last night, as results were still coming in, I had the chance to sit down with some of the candidates who have since won their respective races about their thoughts on county issues. Here are some excerpts from those interviews. Well, let's, let's start back even before the election. Why did you even choose to run for commissioner? Well, I, I felt I've been kicking the idea around for quite some time, and, and being on the Clarion Area School Board, uh, there was a lot of experience going there that, that I thought could be better used along with other people uh, to better serve Clarion County. And I sure was getting sick of the way things were, mm -hmm. as many of the people of mm -hmm. Clarion County has been, and, and that, uh, I could definitely be an asset for Clarion County. Okay. Seipert, who has won one of the county commissioner seats, said that budget issues and opening the lines of communication are large concerns for the county. Right at the minute, uh, we don't know what's in the budget, uh, whether there's going to be anything left to take us into the year 2000 or not. It's all speculation. We won't know to the bottom line's done. As far as the, the open lines of communication, uh, a lot of times uh, it appears as though the auditors have been saying to the county commissioners something about budget concerns of the way we do things, and, and nobody's listening. And I just don't think there's been a, been a line of communication be even between the three commissioners um, that, that is what you would really call productive. I also spoke with another successful county commissioner candidate, Donna Hartle, about why she chose to run for commissioner. I had quite a few people ask me. Uh, they felt that with my abilities, my past experience with county government for 26 years, that uh, I should run. And I, w I decided long ago, no, I wasn't going to do this. And the more I had the people ask me, the more I thought, well, if the support is out there, maybe I should do this. And. Uh, I feel that uh, if I didn't, and with my experience and my knowledge in county government, I would be shortchanging a lot of people if I didn't. So I felt that it was my obligation and my duty to do so. Okay. Uh, in your League of Women Voters issue statement, you had said something about um, running the county as a business. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? I feel that uh, county government, uh, and especially any kind of branch of government right now, is big business. You're looking, Clarion County deals with approximately 15 to a 16 million dollar budget. And uh, you can't technically look at it as government, you have to look at it as a business. You have to make uh, business type decisions when you're dealing with that amount of money. Uh, the services uh, is very much like a, uh, a business. Uh, you've, you've got to put into it, uh, and especially what you think you're going to get out of it. You have to run it like a business. And um, I think the three, whoever the three candidates uh, will be, will be able to do that. Um. The other winner in the county commissioner race, John Shropshire, declined our request for an interview. We spoke with candidates tonight about their stand on the issues, but there's one issue that stood out this year, the idea of a controller versus three county auditors. We did have an opportunity to speak with two of the three winning county auditors about their thoughts on the county and the referendum that was defeated. Um, I've been there eight years. Uh, as a matter of fact, the auditors, you know, that are on the ballot, I've had the opportunity to serve with all of them because um, Bill Lennon um, was defeated in the last election, but I had worked with him the first four years of my term. Okay. So Elected. What's your goals for this next term? Well, we've had quite some battles with our finance department in the last uh, year, and year or so, but we do have it on board a new uh, director in uh, Scott Kiefer, and by the looks of it, he's turned things around there, and um, hopefully it'll be a lot easier job coming up. Uh, so we want to work with the financial director there and try to make sure that things go well. <laughs> you know. uh, a big thing in this race, obviously the commissioner race this year has been big. Uh, the auditor race has been big, I think, only because of the question that's on the ballot about possibly replacing the three auditors with a controller. What's your take on the question? Well, you're right in that. Usually the auditors take back seat to everything. Uh, nobody wants to see you come and nobody, you know. Uh, but I think with this race, uh, in particular this year because of that ballot question um, has made it very interesting and a little extra campaigning has gone into it. I've, um, 
I served with the uh, Pennsylvania State Association of County Auditors as their president this year. And of course the association has been very involved in this um, particular thing and helped us financially with some things and uh, to fight against this. The referendum was defeated with two-thirds of voters voting against it. I also spoke with incumbent Ralph Minnick about his upcoming role in the county. I'm going to be upgrading the office as far as technology. We've just in the last four years we've uh, just started computers. We have probably 75% uh, of our stuff is computerized, so we're going to make it 100%. And uh, that's the, one of the things. And uh, I think probably uh, we're digging in the audits a little more in depth than what we used to. The fact that we have computers and can speed us up. Okay. Uh, I think the big question this year, besides the commissioner race, has been the question that's on the ballot of uh, county controller versus, versus three county auditors. What's your take on that? Well, I researched that a little bit. Uh, we're a six-class county, and there are five six-class counties that have controllers. Uh, the, uh, the range for controller was uh, from 100 to 170 thousand dollars for a controller and a staff. So uh, we feel that a county the size of Clarion and, and the auditor system will work well. And uh, I, I couldn't see any justification for spending that extra money. Gregory Fowler also won a county auditor seat, but was unavailable for an on-air interview. The promise of talks at the World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle didn't happen today. Activists protesting the WTO conference have delayed the opening ceremonies. Many of the delegates planning on attending the talks didn't make it, including Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. I did have the chance to speak with two of the delegates who made it to the talks by satellite this evening. Well, we did. We had a little bit of trouble getting into the center here. There are a number of protesters, and they have a right for their voice to be heard. Unfortunately, I think many of them are really rather misguided the uh, causes that they claim to uh, represent would actually benefit from expanding trade opportunities. But the talks were not totally stalled by the protesters. I don't feel that the demonstrations have made a significant impact. Now I think that the demonstrators have every right to exercise their constitutional rights uh, and some of them have made some good points. The real points to be made in Seattle are the ones dealing with foreign trade. The representatives I spoke with had these thoughts on trade with China and anti-dumping laws. Well, I think the administration negotiated a very good deal with China. Basically, the deal was in return for American support for China's uh, participation in the WTO, China is going to do dramatically lower the tariffs and the taxes that have prevented American goods from being sold in China. It means American farmers and manufacturers are going to have access to China to be able to sell products, create jobs back home. That's a big win-win situation. I think it's essential that Americans have an opportunity to have on the books strong anti-dumping protections to make sure that unfair trade practices aren't allowed to happen in our market. Uh dubbed the battle in Seattle by some major news organizations and based on some of the pictures that we have seen it does look like a battle zone but after a state of emergency was declared and a curfew set protesters still marched last night and today Seattle police say that there have been over 200 arrests of protesters but the WTO meetings are set to continue Seattle police have set a 50 block perimeter around the Seattle meeting center and are arresting protesters Another big development is that President Clinton has arrived in Seattle to address the WTO. But here is a look at what some of the Pennsylvania delegates of the WTO had to say about the United States agenda and specifically President Clinton's agenda for the WTO meeting.
But the U.S. Trade Representative has a very good agenda for what they want to be the final negotiating issues in this next round of trade talks. And one of the priorities is agricultural issues. And as you know, Lehigh Valley farmers have been suffering tremendously from a drought, but also from a glut of agricultural commodities that have driven prices down. One of the priority items on this agenda is to reduce foreign subsidies to their agricultural products, lower barriers, and provide greater opportunity for Lehigh Valley farmers, as well as other farmers, of course, to sell products overseas. The Clinton administration has laid out an effective agenda for the WTO ministerial. They have come in with a limited set of objectives, uh, particularly focusing on agricultural trade, uh, opening up markets for American manufacturers. Uh, those ideas are sound ones, and they have stuck to them. Uh, we have been resisting the efforts of the Europeans to broaden the agenda uh, to the point that it won't lead to an effective ministerial. We're going to be in great shape. Okay. Yeah. Reassuring words from Karen Namaro of Clearing University's Computing Services about the potential Y2K computer bug. We asked Namaro to come to the TV5 control room to see if we were really ready for Y2K. Operations here. Is this going to be okay when Y2K comes? No, well, what we did is we went around and we checked every PC on campus. And you'll note on here there's a blue dot. There's, um, there's a blue A and there's a blue B. Blue B means just turn off your computer before January 1st, and when you come back in, turn it back on again. Blue A means that you need a disk to put it in there, and the disks have been sent out to all the departments. So you should have a disk, just put it in your floppy drive before you turn it on again, and it'll be fine. Okay. So our teleprompter will be okay as long as we insert a disk after January 1st. An another important computer for us is our graphics generator. Tomorrow assured us that this will work fine. As you'll note on this one, your dot is a, is a green one. This one is in even better condition than the other. Green means you are totally 100% compliant. You will have absolutely no problems with it. Okay. Of course, problems could extend to the whole university. And we are very confident that, that we're not going to have too many problems. I'm sure there's going to be little blips and burps here and there. So TV5 and Clearing University are Y2K compliant. That's the good news. What about Clarion Borough? We spent the afternoon with Borough Manager Carol Lapinto to find out if Clarion Borough is ready for January 1st, 2000. Preparing as if we were going to have a major snowstorm. But there are some other preparations necessary for the borough to be ready for Y2K. And we ultimately had to upgrade some computers and we had to buy new accounting software and just until recently uh, we were working to get our police uh, software up to speed. So we're, we're okay there. Uh, another major concern for the borough were the traffic signals. And we believe our signals will be okay. But in order to um, err on the side of safety uh, on the 30th or the 31st at every uh, traffic signal, we will put up a four-way stop just in case they will malfunction. University had yet another power outage today. According to university officials I spoke with, the outage was not a problem caused on campus, but rather a problem off campus. One of the biggest problems of the outage was the Chandler Dining Hall. Now the food hasn't been affected. Uh, it is put away in safe storage until the electric comes back on again. We do have emergency oh, lighting and the lighting has come back on. The dining hall was affected on the university campus. A residence hall and our studios here at TV5 were also affected. Now, it caused our computers to turn off, but everything did come on within seconds, unlike at Chandler and Clarion University's Student Rec Center. The lights kicked out, but right away the emergency generator kicked on, 
So the only thing we lost on uh, the cardio machines were the machines that were plugged into the floor. We had a few machines running on batteries, so the students ran around the track or used the bikes that were on battery powered. The university has become all too familiar with power outages. Officials say they are ready for future outages, but hopefully they won't have to worry about them. At Claring University, Mark Despadakis, TV5 News. I would like to address the council tonight, tonight just briefly regarding the, the sidewalks and the issue of, of uh, restoring a lot of them around town. We need to know for sure, when, since we're doing this, that we do it the correct way. It, it is really pretty upsetting to be here for three months and find out that I have a, a five ten thousand dollar problem sitting in my front yard. Some strong words and strong opinions heard last night at Clarion Borough Council about the mandate that sidewalks are a liability and must be fixed. After the last council meeting last month, I felt very strongly that indeed the time was way too short. Uh, I myself had had concrete done last year, and I know how long it took for me to finally have someone appear there and actually do the physical work. The problem raises that some residents received a letter in November alerting them of a July 1st deadline, while others just received the letter recently. But council members are still optimistic about the sidewalks being fixed. I mean, I really think that uh, this is an alert to people that it is a problem. Well, they are liable. They are. They are. That's extremely liable. They always have been. That's right. Mm -hmm. and the, the whole idea behind this was to make them aware, and I know this is what you're talking about, make them aware of the liability. Several proposals were brought up by various members of council as a resolution to ailing sidewalks. But since the meeting had already gone over an hour long, they decided a special work session would be in order. So here's the situation as it stands right now. The letters that have been sent out to residents about the sidewalks will still be in effect, so that means the July 1st deadline still stands. But that could all change with a special meeting that happens this coming Monday at 4 o'clock in the Clarion Borough offices. So we'll just have to wait and see what comes out of that meeting to decide what happens next. In the newsroom, Mark Espadakis, TV5 News. Looks like we drew a crowd. <laughs> With over 100 media filling the ballroom at the Weston William Penn Hotel in downtown Pittsburgh this morning, Arizona Senator and former Republican presidential candidate John McCain officially announced his support for Texas Governor George W. Bush to be the next president of the United States. Um, I want to work to elect Governor Bush. I want to elect and re-elect uh, Republicans so we will maintain control of the House and the Senate. Governor Bush and I agree that that is vital for, to his ability to effectively be president of the United States to work with a Republican Congress. The announcement comes after a meeting between Bush and McCain that some political analysts called a reconciliation and the biggest political event of the 2000 campaign. We had a very good meeting. We talked about a variety of issues. <coughs> We're in agreement in a lot more issues in which we are in disagreement. Uh, I have said uh, from the very beginning that I will support the nominee of the party. I look forward to enthusiastically campaigning uh, for Governor Bush. Just minutes following the press conference and endorsement, the Democratic National Committee held another press conference to rebut comments made by McCain and Bush. What you heard today was George W. Bush claim that he and John McCain agreed on some things. What they were is just as secret as his Social Security plan. National Chair of the DNC, Joe Andra, also debuted a CD that has audio clips like this one that show McCain in opposition to Bush. Unfortunately, Governor Bush is a Pat Robertson Republican who will lose to Al Gore. So McCain has officially endorsed Governor George W. Bush. And the Democrats, well, they're still not happy with George W. Bush's plans for America. What will happen in the future, we'll just have to see as Campaign 2000 continues. In downtown Pittsburgh at the Weston William Penn Hotel, Mark Despadakis, TV5 News.
Looks like we drew a crowd. <laughs> With over 100 media filling the ballroom at the Weston William Penn Hotel in downtown Pittsburgh this morning, Arizona Senator and former Republican presidential candidate John McCain officially announced his support for Texas Governor George W. Bush to be the next president of the United States. Um, I want to work to elect Governor Bush. I want to elect and re-elect uh, Republicans so we will maintain control of the House and the Senate. Governor Bush and I agree that that is vital for, to his ability to effectively be president of the United States to work with a Republican Congress. The announcement comes after a meeting between Bush and McCain that some political analysts called a reconciliation and the biggest political event of the 2000 campaign. We had a very good meeting. We talked about a variety of issues. <coughs> We're in agreement in a lot more issues in which we are in disagreement. Uh, I have said uh, from the very beginning that I will support the nominee of the party. I look forward to enthusiastically campaigning uh, for Governor Bush. Just minutes following the press conference and endorsement, the Democratic National Committee held another press conference to rebut comments made by McCain and Bush. What you heard today was George W. Bush claim that he and John McCain agreed on some things. What they were is just as secret as his Social Security plan. National Chair of the DNC, Joe Andra, also debuted a CD that has audio clips like this one that show McCain in opposition to Bush. Unfortunately, Governor Bush is a Pat Robertson Republican who will lose to Al Gore. So McCain has officially endorsed Governor George W. Bush. And the Democrats, well, they're still not happy with George W. Bush's plans for America. What will happen in the future, we'll just have to see as Campaign 2000 continues. In downtown Pittsburgh at the Weston William Penn Hotel, Mark Despodakis, TV5 News. Clarion University's renovations of Carlson Library were put on hold earlier today. A fire that appears to have been sparked by a construction worker's torch occurred today at approximately 2.04 p.m. at the Carlson Library construction site at Clarion University. Clarion and Strattonville Fire Departments responded with 25 to 30 firefighters on scene. The fire was quickly controlled and further damage was averted. Uh, the fire had broke through uh, to the roof and we had to actually put some ladders up on the building and we had to uh, uh, run some water lines up onto the building and uh, cut away some of the roofing materials to get into the fire. Uh, so that was probably the most difficult portion. One concern was the possibility of toxins released from the burning insulation. Clarion University's Director of Public Safety spoke to that issue. Based on what we know now, there's no reason to believe that uh, uh, there was an especially hazardous smoke uh, from there. Uh, to be sure, we're uh, looking into specifically the type of insulation that was used, uh, and we're going to we are looking into that further. Renovations here at the Carlson Library and the Clarion University campus were interrupted today by a fire, but that's not the only university facility that was interrupted. Dorm life right next door at Beck Hall was also interrupted. And I said to my roommate, um, the rest of the library that they were going to save is now on fire, so. And then, like, about 10 minutes later, the alarms went off and we were evacuated from BACT. Construction is scheduled to resume tomorrow while damage assessments continue. Then, then we get into the extent of damage, and we just don't know that yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're waiting on the, the, uh, the architect, as, uh, as Ron has mentioned, has been uh, notified. Department of General Services will be in consultations with them, and then there will be, uh, there'll be an assessment of what anything extra needs to be done, apart from what needed to be uh, removed anyway. Just after 11.30 a.m., Secret Service agents responded to the sound of gunshots near the southwest gate of the White House. Officers spotted a 47-year-old man waving a handgun 
and surrounded him. They probably talked to him for, I would say, a good 10, 15 minutes. Um, and all I could make out was, you know, drop the gun. It doesn't have to be this way. They heard shots fired and proceeded to surround a subject who uh, was wielding a weapon, a gun. A 10-minute standoff ensued, following which time the Secret Service fired a shot into the suspect's leg. The suspect, Robert Pickett, was taken to George Washington University Hospital with a gunshot wound to the leg. He's been shot in the leg doing damage to the right knee joint. Moments after the incident, Secret Service agents surrounded the White House and closed off several streets. Officials confirmed the president was in the White House but was never in any danger. Clarionboro Police, along with several other area agencies, responded to the National City Bank on Main Street this afternoon. 2.30 this afternoon, one male entered the bank. There were no other customers in the bank at the time. He approached one of the bank personnel, uh, wrote out a, a note, delivered that note to the bank personnel, demanding the money from the bank. Clarion University public safety officials took precautions on campus by posting crime alert signs in all campus buildings. Well, the, there are officers... Uh, from other departments who are assisting us in actually going uh, into the residence halls uh, and speaking with people uh, personally to stress the importance of letting us know, you know, if this person is seen, that it's important that uh, the police be notified. The investigation continues into the robbery of the Clarion branch of National City Bank. This man, Paul Charles Schooneman, as seen in bank surveillance tape, is the main suspect. A search warrant was served on his room on Saturday morning. Uh, we removed certain items from that uh, room that support the evidence that he was involved in this robbery. A federal arrest warrant has been issued for Schooneman, who was in his freshman year at Clarion University. The suspect does have a criminal record in his hometown of Harrisburg. Police say they saw the suspect leave his Campbell Hall residence Friday afternoon and are asking him to come forward. And we're hoping that um, before we find him that the young man gets his head screwed on right and, and turns himself in and doesn't make anything any worse than what they already are against him. Clarion Borough Police, along with FBI agents, have been on the lookout for this man, Paul Charles Schooneman. He is the main suspect in last week's Clarion National City Bank robbery. Police say the man was caught earlier today in Kentucky, but was in the New York City area before he went to Kentucky. TV5 has obtained this video that possibly shows Schooneman appearing on MTV's Direct Effect television show last night. He is the one wearing the blue hat on the left side of your screen. People who knew Schooneman came forward declaring University Public Safety this morning with the tape. Tapes.
Merge started early and ran deep. For investors, there was nowhere to hide. Stocks labeled safe havens recently, consumer-oriented such as Walmart, Procter & Gamble, and Coca-Cola, all finished in negative territory. The word from experts on Wall Street, it is not one specific ailment harming the markets. Overall weakness in the global economy is hurting companies doing business that extend beyond U.S. borders. You know, we've got a worldwide, potential worldwide slowdown, and, and as I said, that's, that's very disruptive to the whole world economy right now, and that's something that we're trying to deal with. And EMA corporate earnings continue to haunt. And the fact that Alan Greenspan and the Federal Reserve haven't stepped in and reduced interest rates in an effort to breathe some life into the economy hasn't helped. The chief executive of Cisco Systems has more sobering comments for the tech sector. John Chambers is cautioning that the sharp slowdown in the economy is likely to be felt the entire year. Cisco and a number of other important tech stops like Intel, Oracle, and Yahoo closed down today. It also dampens the prospect of a quick rejuvenation for the markets. President Bush says despite all the bad news, he's still optimistic about the economy. I'm sorry people are losing value in their portfolios. That worries me. But with the right policies, I'm confident our economy will recover. Last Thursday's Clarion County Commissioners and Salary Board meetings drew few audience members, but created some big news. We welcome Mr. Rowley uh, on board as Clarion County Warden, effective Monday. Uh, we are very pleased and honored uh, to have him in our employment. That's right, a new jail warden for Clarion County. John Rowley was named to the position by unanimous vote. Rowley will earn $42,000 a year. He started the job yesterday, but it's not new to the idea of coming into a situation like the Clarion County Jails. This is not the first time I've done this. Uh, this is uh, my fifth or sixth institution, and uh, I'm excited about just uh, getting into looking at the immediate needs, the concerns of the board. Uh, after that, I want to take a look at the uh, security operations um, from a first uh, view of them, or first blush. Uh, they seem to be uh, in, in tune pretty good, uh, but I want to make sure those aspects are tightened up, and then I want to begin to take a look at the, the treatment programming that we have available for the inmates. Uh, so John Rowley has been officially hired as the new prison warden for Clarion County, but how do those who hired him feel about him taking over the position? Clarion County Commissioner David Seiper, who also served on the county's board of inspectors, which chose the new warden, feels confident with Rowley in the position. I'm very pleased with them. Uh, like I said, all the references uh, that come back on them was just overwhelmingly excellent. And uh, in the one county, uh, he went into a, a quite a, a bad situation, and he straightened it out in pretty short order, so I can't see where he uh, is going to be anything but an asset to, to Clarion County. So what do you Riley replaces former jail warden Daniel Hornberger, who was terminated in January after various problems at the jail. But everyone is looking forward to positive results from Riley. Done his uh, check of references and all come back uh, extremely strong. Uh, one even wrote, you're real lucky to get them. So uh, I, I think we've definitely made, made the right move. I know. And as for Riley, well, this isn't his first time in Clarion. Uh, I've driven up here uh, years ago when I was in college. I had a friend that was going to Clarion University, so I came up to visit him. Um, and I enjoyed the visit, and uh, the area as far as uh, the Clarion River and the, the terrain. Amazing Grace. To Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. To Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. To 
Greeks were singing. It was the kickoff of Greek Week 2001. And we will certainly remember this day. We had no fears, but the Greeks had dreams of victory, carefully preparing every note vocally and visually. It was really fun up there. Uh, in previous years, uh, we were probably a little bit more nervous, but since it's like our third year, or at least my third year doing it, uh, it, was, it was pretty fun. It was a lot of fun. So fraternities and sororities practice for weeks for Greek week, especially Greek sing. It's a lot of fun for them, but it's also a lot of fun for the audience, especially the informal performances. At times, it looked like ancient Egypt and the country farm. But there was also fierce competition. Those that had good harmony, I enjoyed very much. And when the Zetas won, well, they almost brought the balcony down. Everyone had a great time and made memories that will last a lifetime. It was an awesome experience. We practiced like a lot, and it was so much fun to actually get up on stage and perform it in front of everyone. And we felt like it was a big accomplishment, and we're really proud of ourselves. In the Mark Boyd Auditorium at Claring University, Mark Despedagas, TV5 News. And with that, it was the start of Greek Olympics. From flag football to chariot races, we saw it all. Each sorority and fraternity competing against each other in a diligent attempt to beat the clock and bring home a victory. What special diet did Sig Pi go on to get ready for today? Well, Sigma Pi, every morning we would get up at 6 a.m. We had breakfast together. We ate a lot of beans, a lot of cornmeal. Uh, we had tryouts for our events. Uh, the, the main thing that we, that we would really try to do this week is drink a lot of water and it came, it came down to, to ketchup, you know, like we, we had a lot of it, we, put it, we pulled it all together. Ketchup? Well, at least one sorority took a different approach from that. We drank our protein shakes today. <laughs> and ate our Wheaties, our Wheaties too. Yes. Well, are you guys going to be on the Wheaties box? Is that what you're hoping for after this? Uh, that's what I'm hoping for. I'm going to talk to the um, people from Wheaties right after. I think they're waiting think they're down right there down for there, me. Yeah. yeah. How are you trying to, you know, let the competition know that you guys are going to win? We figure by the way that we look, we can be very intimidating and, you know, be a threat to the other sororities. Yes, we can. Notice the bandanas and the socks. From potato sack races to three-legged races to touchdowns and falling in the mud, Everyone had a great time. So that brings an end to this year's Greek Week events. We're only 358 days away until next year's events. So I'm here with the Zetas, and are you guys ready for next year? Yeah! It was a lot of fun this week. Downtown at the stadium, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. The four planes were hijacked by between three and six individuals per plane using knives and box cutters and in some cases making bomb threats. Then runs for cover. But it won't be able to run for cover forever. This is an enemy that tries to hide, but it won't be able to hide forever.
Back to you in the studio. All okay, right, thank, thank you very much, John. Our focus is still in a response mode, and that would be to identify, if we can, those that are still alive and remove them from the rubble. Her goal, to spread the message of the state system of higher education. So it's really Her first stop to detail that message, Principal Clarion. One of the things that's always impressed me about the universities in our system, and it's part of why I was interested in this position in the first place, is the very strong core uh, curriculum that is the foundation for every major that our students uh, have. New state system chancellor Dr. Judy Hample made her first stop on a tour of state system universities here at Clarion University. She spoke with students, faculty and staff at an open forum on September 6th. I wanted an open forum to give you a chance uh, to help educate me as the new chancellor, uh, someone who's new to your state, who's very anxious to learn about what's of interest and concern to you. Her visit to Clarion University was a welcome one, according to University also, President Dr. Diane Reinhardt. Um, I think, Mark, you know that I served on the search committee um, when uh, I was the presidential uh, uh, representative on the search committee, so I got to know the, the Judy before anybody else did. And so I've been very impressed with her. Hample is using her visits to various campuses to discover the issues facing the entire state system. Once she assesses the issues at each campus, she feels she'll be better able to serve the system and the entire state. At Clarion University, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. Neighbors in Clarion Borough will see new parking meter rules on Main Street beginning this December. That was one of the first orders of business at last night's Clarion Borough Council meeting. Council approved a request from the Clarion Area Business Association to allow shoppers on Main Street to park for free from December 10th to January 1st. But starting on January 2nd, the plan to double parking fines from $1 to $2 will go into effect. We don't put money in the parking meters in town to make money. That's not our goal. Our goal is to create a turnover so that there are more potential parking spaces. Skateboarding is back in the news. Council discussed the possibility of confiscating skateboards from those riding them on Main Street. No official action was taken, but the plan could call for confiscating skateboards for up to six months after repeated offenses. Trick-or-treating in the borough has been set for 6 to 8 p.m. on October 31st. If you wish to participate in those events, Council asks that you leave your lights on that evening. The Clarion Borough Public Works Department is moving, and in the process of moving, they have come across surplus equipment. Borough Manager Carol Lapinto announced that the sale of the equipment could come at the end of this month. And if you would like to see any of that equipment before the sale, contact Borough Manager Carol Lapinto at the Clarion Borough offices. In the newsroom, Mark Despedakis, TV5 News. One minute, a life changed. And that life changed because of a drunk driver. But thankfully, this accident wasn't real. 
It was part of a program organized by Clarion University students to bring light to the dangers of drunk driving. Organizer and actress in the mock accident, Jill Reinhardt, hope this scene got the message across. Well, I know a lot of high schools and stuff put these on before prom, but I'm sure a lot of people did, because I know when they first saw the cars coming in, they were like, what's going on, what's going on, and I think they realized that this could actually happen, this one day could be them. The mock accident brought in Clarion Borough Police, Clarion Fire Department, Clarion Hospital, as well as Stat Medevac. We work real close uh, with the students here. Uh, you know, I thank them. They did a terrific job putting this all together. Uh, between myself and them, we met a couple times. We put everything together. I contacted the emergency services, and we have done these drills before, but we also work together every day of the week. So, Firefighters and EMS crews work at this mock crash scene in the attempts of getting a message across to those who are watching. And those firefighters and EMS crews hope they will never have to actually respond to a drunk driving accident of this magnitude. It's good for the students to see. And, and again, it's not just the students. You know, I hope the community that I saw around here tonight watching is also taken in this, some of this in. So it's good for them. It's pretty gruesome. Um, I would never want that to happen to me, ever. Um, the kid lost his girlfriend. That's a pretty horrible thing. I wouldn't know how to deal with that. So here outside of Nair Hall, the crowd has dissipated and the fire trucks are leaving. But organizers of this event hope that the crowd that was here to watch tonight will think twice before they drink and drive. At Clarion University, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. Well, thanks, Pat. Uh, earlier today, a bomb threat was found in a bathroom stall actually right inside here, uh, here in Clarion University's Davis Hall. Now, Davis Hall never actually closed at any point today, uh, and it still remains open tonight. In fact, as we've been standing here, some people have been going in and out of the building. Earlier today, I spoke with Clarion University's Director of Public Safety, Dave Chajeski. Here is uh, his explanation of what happened today. Well, we received uh, a report that there was a, a general bomb threat uh, that was written on the uh, bathroom stall uh, wall in one of the uh, restrooms in the Davis Hall. Okay. And uh, what are you guys still investigating? Is, this, is University Public Safety still investigating? Yes, uh, the University's Public Safety Department, uh, with the help of some outside agencies, is continuing to investigate this. Uh, we're, uh, at this point, we're treating it as a uh, terrorist and threats offense. Uh, if the person's identified, they'll be criminally prosecuted. Now, Tajeski would not comment on any suspects in the situation. The investigation does continue. It is being conducted by Clarion University Public Safety, as well as state and federal agencies, that according to Dave Tajeski. Reporting live from Davis Hall on the Clarion University campus, Mark Despotakis. TV5 News. Well, a lot of folks are saying it's the next governor of the state, and we're just pleased that he could be here with us and and uh, what can you say? Bob Casey Jr. may very well be Pennsylvania's next governor, but he attended last week's Clarion Democratic Fall Dinner to spread the message of one candidate running in next week's general election for Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Judge Kate Ford Elliott, who is now a member of the Superior Court, is running for Supreme Court. And we want to make sure that uh, we talk about her, her campaign and also talk about the other, uh, uh, the other candidates running, and I'll, I'll go through them uh, tonight. Of course, Kate Ford Elliott was not the only topic of Casey's visit. He hopes Clarion County can help him become the next governor of this commonwealth. Well, the first thing is, uh, you know, as a candidate for governor in 2002, which I will be, you have to win a primary. And uh, part of that uh, 
process is getting to communities in Pennsylvania, including Clarion County, that are part of the uh, the Democratic primary, and there'll be thousands of people that will vote in that primary. Casey's visit came just one week and a half before the general election. So now here we stand a week before the general election, and Clarion County Democrats hope that Casey's visit will stick with voters and that they will remember to vote Democratic in two important county races, the county coroner's race and the race for the sheriff. In the newsroom, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. News of the loss of legendary KDK TV news anchor Patty Burns did not come as a shock. We knew of her battle with cancer, but still had hope. She was only 49 years old, but had a career most in journalism could only hope for. Here in the Dallas Convention covering Center, everything from political conventions other members of the media. to meeting the Pope to even anchoring the news with her father. Patty Burns got her start young with her father as she remembered here on KDKA's Pittsburgh Today. Broadcasting because Dad used to take me on a lot of stories with him and I can remember one definitely. Do you remember the Christmas Eve you took me to Western State Penitentiary? Yes, that's correct. I recall that. You were just a child. I was only about 12 years old and what an experience that was to go into a state... And Patty went to a political convention with me. Yes, oh, covered that. Right that was quite exciting. Western Pennsylvania felt a special bond with Patty, as did Patty with this area. Evidence of that was shown when Patty recovered from her first health scare. And Pittsburgh is the greatest city. I, for one, would not want to live anywhere else. No, nor would I, Dad. And it's really, it's, it's been overwhelming. And, and all the notes and the prayers, I can't tell you what it, what it has really meant to me from my, the bottom of my heart. Thank you all so very, very much. Not only are the residents of Western Pennsylvania feeling the loss of Patty Burns, so are her colleagues at KDKA TV. Patty, you know, we've all talked about one of the gifts of, of spending time with her and having her as part of our life is her sense of humor. Oh, she was so much fun. And, and the way she would just laugh and things that would happen in commercial breaks. There was one shot they had just a few moments ago that I said, that's Patty. Yeah. That she was just laughing, she was smiling, that warmth. Last night's Clarion Borough Council meeting was one of the shortest in the last few months. It was the last meeting for Council President Ray Austin, Mayor Yoho, and Council Members Mel Riffer and Lee Rupert. Council also approved the tentative budget, and the good news, taxes won't be raised. The most important thing, it means no tax increase. This will be the ninth year in a row that we've uh, been able to hold the line on taxes. The final adoption of the budget is expected at a special meeting to be held December 20th. Council also reminded residents that leaf collection ended this past Saturday. Residents are asked not to put out any more leaves. Public Works is not accepting leaves, leaves bags of leaves anywhere anymore. Borough manager Carol Lapinto also presented some information about Clarion Borough joining a council of governments. That proposal, along with others, are being left to the new council to decide. That new council takes office in January. In the newsroom, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. A new tradition for Clarion. Two, three. three. Whoa, whoa. A new tradition for Clarion indeed. Last night marked the first annual holiday tree lighting outside of Clarion University's Carrier Administration Building. Why start this? Well, I think because of uh, September 11th uh, that it's it's nice to come together as a community and to remember um, the tragedy, but also to remember. Uh, what the holidays are all about and to wish for peace and to do it with the ceremonial lighting of a holiday tree. 
Trees and gatherings of family and friends have always been a part of this time of the year. But this year, those gatherings seem so much more important. This tree lighting service included a moment of silence for those affected by the tragedy of September 11th. One CU student, Candida Robertson, appreciates the tree lighting. And I really like it because I'm from New York, and in New York they have this all the time. So it's just like I feel more at home now that they have like a ritual like this. Like where I live, I look out my window and I see the Twin Towers. Now, like, it's like weird. I went home for Thanksgiving and it was like weird. I, it wasn't the same. Tonight's holiday tree lighting was designed to celebrate the holidays here in Clarion, as well as remember those who were affected by the tragedy of September 11th. But this tradition will probably continue in years to come with more additions. In the future we'll have like the, the bell tower which may bring more students down uh, after the bell tower is, is put in place uh, next summer. It's something that a lot of campuses don't do. Um, friends that go to other schools and I just thought it, it's neat, you know, something that brings the campus together, especially at a time like this. Sometimes the simple act of a tree lighting can help us through troubling times. Friends, family, even strangers, and people of all ages can gather together and admire the Christmas tree. At Clarion University, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. Tuesday night marks the second meeting of a newly elected Clarion Borough Council. These pictures show last month's council meeting where, among other things, newly elected Clarion Borough Council member Ron Wilshire was elected council president. But you may be familiar with Wilshire since he was on council in years past and he also served as council president. Well, it's, it's coming back with a bang, I guess. Uh, I look forward to, to working with the council. We have a good council, and I, f I feel we can all work together to achieve a lot of things in the council. It's, it's a lot of work, but I, I'm acquainted with it, so I, I think it should run pretty smoothly. What do you in other council business, newly elected council member Elaine Moore is the new council vice president. One other notable person at the meeting was Earl Zerfoss. Now, Zerfoss isn't a new member of council, but he has been absent from council meetings for the last few months due to a car accident last year. It's good to be back. Uh, uh, I haven't been, it's been since the 16th of October, and uh, outside of going to my uh, daughter and son-in-law's house on Christmas Eve, this is the first time out. Uh, and I, this was my goal, to be here for the reorganizational meeting of council and uh, to speak up what I, thought needs to be spoken about. So then your borough council meets next Tuesday at 7 p.m. and you can see the meeting live right here on TV5. In the newsroom, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. I'm sure you've heard by now that on Saturday, in front of thousands of faithful followers, Punxsutawney Phil saw his shadow, signaling six more weeks of winter. With Punxsutawney only a 45-minute drive from Clarion, lots of people from our area made the trip to Gobbler's Knob to see Phil. We're having fun. We're here to see Phil, man. I'm excited. We're out here because there's nothing better to do in Pennsylvania on February 6th. Clarion's name out or? Clarion, yes. Clarion, it rocks! Clarion rocks, yeah! Some Clarion University students even came to Punxsie disguised as Phil. We're showing Phil the love. Well, take a look behind me. You can see the crowd is ready for Phil to make his prediction. And they made an announcement here just a few minutes ago that they sold all of the bus passes for the shuttle buses bringing people here. They sold every bus pass that was printed, and that's 38,000. Those thousands of people made their way from all over the country to see Phil, or as one person put it, Go, Sexy Groundhog. 
Well, sexy groundhog or not, people are a gobbler's knob to have fun. We came through the beaver. I mean, it's a second favorite holiday in the United States. And we thought we can't miss it. You know, we have a free weekend. Let's drive to Pennsylvania, I told. The freezing temperatures couldn't keep people away from Punxsy. Even Elvis and survivors Amber Burkett showed up for the early morning party, which included a huge fireworks display that celebrated the American spirit. We also ran into a familiar face to TV5 viewers, our own CNN Washington correspondent, Elaine Quijano. Oh, it's a great time, I can't tell you. The war on terror, that's all been pretty much everything that I've done every day since September 11th. I mean, it's uh, a nice switch, a nice change of pace. The atmosphere here is great, the people are great. Um, it's a fun time and it's nice to see that really we live in a country where you can celebrate something as fun and frivolous as Groundhog Day. So no matter what Phil's prediction was, the crowds out here had a great time and were united behind all that is American. In Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. The word from this morning's commissioner's meeting is that jail warden John Rowley will leave his post in three weeks. It was an opening at a detention center in southern South Carolina. Uh, it's all history from there for the last several months. This is negotiations have been going on. This has been precipitated by my uh, wife's uh, long desire to move to south. Commissioners also signed a proclamation declaring February is American Heart Month in the county. Commissioners became a billboard of sorts with t-shirts promoting the American Heart Association's Heart Walk, which has been tentatively scheduled for September 8th at the Clarion University Venango campus. Commissioner Donna Hartle read the proclamation and noted how close this proclamation is to the hearts of county commissioners. The month of February should be the time devoted in expressing our love and concern for those who are most dear to us. We dedicate this proclamation Memory. This morning, commissioners reappoint eight members to the county's park advisory board. Park Director Michael Johnson has some plans to spruce the park, as Commissioner Campbell noted. If you haven't visited the park, go in the summer and look at it. You're going to see a lot of real park changes in there. Commissioners also announced that Old Hospital and South of Avenue will be purchased from Delridge Corporation for $880,000. In the newsroom, Mark Dispatakis, TV5 News. Did you like More housing is on the way for Clarion University, and that new housing could be in place as soon as 2003. The Clarion Foundation purchased property currently known as Magnolia Estates. The property is seen in this aerial photo. It is completely in Clarion Township. So Magnolia Estates is just three-tenths of a mile away from Clarion University. Now, as you saw in this aerial photo, it's a lot of property out here. So we actually came out the property to see what was here. Now judging by the map they have here, there are only three properties sold and that's three properties that currently have houses on them. If you take a look, most of the property out here is covered with trees. The deal closed yesterday with the foundation paying 2.1 million dollars for the land and no university funds were used for the purchase. Under the plan, these 69 acres will be transformed into community-oriented student apartment style housing. The housing will be installed in two segments. Under the plan, 160 beds will be in place by the fall of 2003. Our initial uh, goal is to establish first 160 bed housing uh, and then follow up with that with the second phase of that which would be another 160 bed uh, housing. Uh, to tell you that we know exactly what that's going to look like at this point is, is false. This new acquisition comes after the state system of higher education asked universities to seek private-public partnerships to help suit their housing needs. We did not use state funds for, for the purchase of, of this land, um, nor is there any 
um, you know, plan to use state dollars to build the, the um, uh, student housing. So is this property owned by the foundation taxable? Uh, properties uh, all are taxable and uh, our plan is not complete as to how to deal with that in the future. Um, we have no immediate plan to apply to have the property removed from the tax rolls. Of course there are many details to be worked out before work can begin, including design, sewer taps, and construction. The foundation as well as university officials hope this new development will be an appetizing alternative for university students who prefer to live in an off-campus setting. In Clarion Township, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. Could these two buildings become a home for chickens? Well, actually yes. Clarion Borough Council received an unsolicited proposal from Melvin Lengotcher to dismantle the buildings. Under the agreement that was approved today, these two buildings will be dismantled and then reassembled on Lengotcher's Sligo Farm. There they'll be used to house 2,200 chickens. That's right, 2,200 chickens. Lengotcher is an Amish man. He plans on assembling a crew to dismantle these buildings. In fact, he was ready to start last week. He thought he could just come in here and, and do this. In fact, he had a crew coming from Indiana. Len Gawker will pay the borough one dollar for taking the buildings. That sum includes removing all framing, windows, and doors above the cement foundation. The buildings have been deemed unmarketable and could only be salvaged for under $500. The largest concern raised was that of insuring Len Gawker and other workers at the site. I'm just wondering, is anybody a little nervous about the exposure liability-wise that the borough has? I mean, I, I am. I'm, maybe I'm nervous for no reason. We, we generally can trust these people. And they, I think they do have a track record of, of completing projects and, and making them whole. And I think if there were any problems, we could, you know, expect them to make it whole. De Work at the site could begin as early as Monday. In Clarion Borough, Mark Despotakis, TV5 News. I'm here uh, in the Gemmell Student Complex at Clarion University with uh, State Senator Alan Kukovich, also running for Lieutenant Governor, and that's pretty much why you're here today. Um, you've called for, you're saying if, if, you, if you get in, you become the Lieutenant Governor, a special session on education. And um, talking about education, uh, in one of your press releases you say, the quality of one's education should not be determined by the value of the homes in the community. Could you explain uh, what you mean by that and what your plans are there? Okay. What I mean is that we've got 501 school districts in Pennsylvania, and there's a great disparity between the amount of money spent per student in each of those districts, uh, as great as three or four to one. In some poor districts, 4,000 some dollars might be spent per student per year. In some wealthy suburban districts, it could be 12, 14, 16,000. Uh, the mission of public education is to make sure that all children get a fair chance at a quality education. And that's what I mean by the quality of one's education shouldn't depend solely on the luck of where they're born. You're here at Clarion University today in Clarion County and, and you're going to be speaking uh, in just a few minutes to some university students. What about higher education? We have the state system of higher education as well as other state funded schools. Um, obviously education in nowadays almost always goes beyond the 12th grade and, and secondary ed. It goes to higher education. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I just recently I talked about how we need to have this special session and one of the components of that session should be what to do about higher ed. Uh, number one, we can't cut like we have or freeze the funds as we did last year and now the governor's calling for a three percent cut. 
uh, we need to realize that spending money on our colleges, our state system, um, is an investment, an economic investment in our communities and in our state. And every dollar that, that, that we put in, that the state puts in, into a college, returns almost twice that much to the community. Uh, we need to recognize that. Uh, last question briefly. Every president has a vice president, and in Pennsylvania, our governor has a lieutenant governor. Any talk of uh, running mate teaming up in any way with uh, Rendell or Casey? Well, there's been a lot of talk, but I, I'm not sure if, if any of that is, is going to happen. Uh, I've been trying to run independently, and I'm fortunate to have support of, of many people and organizations that support Bob Casey and, and many who support Ed Rendell. Senator Alan Kukovich, thank you for joining us. Courtney and Susan, we'll send it back to you. I'm here uh, in the Gemmell Student Complex at Clarion University with uh, State Senator Alan Kukovich, also running for Lieutenant Governor, and that's pretty much why you're here today. Um, you've called for, you're saying if, if, you, if you get in, you become the Lieutenant Governor, a special session on education. And um, talking about education, uh, in one of your press releases you say, the quality of one's education should not be determined by the value of the homes in the community. Could you explain uh, what you mean by that and what your plans are there? Okay. What I mean is that we've got 501 school districts in Pennsylvania, and there's a great disparity between the amount of money spent per student in each of those districts, uh, as great as three or four to one. In some poorer districts, 4,000 some dollars might be spent per student per year. In some wealthy suburban districts, it could be 12, 14, 16,000. Um, the mission of public education is to make sure that all children get a fair chance at a quality education. And that's what I mean by the quality of one's education shouldn't depend solely on the luck of where they're born. Um, I, I think that defeats the whole mission of, of public education. Now what we intend to do about it is to begin to focus on how the state can pick up more of the fair share of the basic educational subsidy, which once was 50 percent and now has dropped to 35 percent. And when that happens, the burden shifts to the property tax. And the property tax leads to that kind of inequity plus it's also unfair to people on fixed incomes and homeowners of certain incomes and senior citizens um, and that's something that needs to be changed. You're here at Clarion University today in Clarion County and, and you're going to be speaking uh, in just a few minutes to some university students. What about higher education? We have the state system of higher education as well as other state funded schools. Um, Obviously, education in nowadays almost always goes beyond the 12th grade and, and secondary ed. It goes to higher education. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, just recently I talked about how we need to have this special session, and one of the components of that session should be what to do about higher ed. Uh, number one, we can't cut like we have or freeze the funds as we did last year, and now the government's calling for a 3% cut. Uh, we need to realize that spending money on our colleges, our state system, um, is an investment, an economic investment in our communities and in our state. And every dollar that, that, that we put in, that the state puts in, into a college, returns almost twice that much to the community. Uh, we need to recognize that. And so I would uh, make sure that, that in our future budgets, incrementally, each year we try to increase the funding to those schools a little more. Secondly, I would like to see FIA expanded. Uh, make Higher education yes. assistance. I'm sorry, yes. I hate to use acronyms <laughs> like that. But it, it's the major vehicle that the state can use, use to provide loans primarily, in some instances grants, to students. Um, it, it'll hopefully keep tuition costs down. It'll make it makes, uh, colleges more available to, to our students. And thirdly, I, I think we need to, to start thinking at the state level in terms of moving economic development people closer to educational people, taking the various departments at the state level that deal with economic development and education, have them work together to provide grants for other types of aid to students for post-secondary training, which could be different types of, of vocational schools, could be uh, for associate degree programs at, at uh, community colleges and other types of schools which have the potential not only to, to give a student a good base, give them a chance to, to earn some money, but lay the groundwork for them maybe a little bit later 
to move on to uh, to a school like Clarion or a four-year baccalaureate mm -hmm. degree school and uh, and improve their chances to, to uh, advance and grow and still stay in the community. I, I think that's our real goal. Uh, last question briefly. Every president has a vice president, and in Pennsylvania our governor has a lieutenant governor. Any talk of uh, running mate teaming up in any way with uh, Rendell or Casey? Well, there's been a lot of talk, but I, I'm <laughs> not sure if, if any of that is, is going to happen. Uh, I've been trying to run independently, and I'm fortunate to have support of of many people and organizations that support Bob Casey and, and many who support Ed Rendell. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, to run independently because what I'm doing is trying to not only win an election, but win in a way that I can redefine the role of lieutenant governor, make that position more meaningful. As long as the taxpayers are going to pay for that position and that office, let's make sure it can accomplish more. And that means by uh, having the experience to, to move a legislative agenda uh, that, that the governor's office has through the legislature to actually accomplish some things, to use the positions that we have with Pima and o other entities that deal with local government and land use planning and economic development to be a very aggressive partner with local municipalities and counties and the private sector to make sure that we have a game plan that's going to mean that, that we are going to, to grow in a very smart way, uh, help our towns, help our cities, try to avoid uh, destroying open space and keeping uh, as much of Pennsylvania clean and green as possible. Uh, and, that, and those are very active roles that, that I think Lieutenant Governor should play, and in the past uh, hasn't. And then at 10 o'clock, a story that, that hit much closer home, and Carrie's going to give us uh, some more details on it in just a few minutes here. Uh, United Airlines uh, Flight 93 crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. That is near the Somerset area. That was just a piece of the story, now just over six months old. America and the world stood still and watched the nation under attack. In the last few days, we have seen the horrific events of 9-11 play out in front of us yet again. But we are also looking forward. Six months after United Airlines Flight 93 crashed into a rural Pennsylvania field, its passengers and crew were honored Monday as heroes who gave their lives to prevent an even greater tragedy. People crowded into the United Methodist Church in Shanksville for a multi-denominational service honoring the 40 victims of the September 11th crash. Candles were lit as the names of victims were read. People also gathered for a ceremony at the crash site. A children's choir sang, and red, white, and blue paper angels were placed at the edge of the field. A memorial was set up in Shanksville, and the people of this small town have taken on the task of tending to it. One thing that will likely happen, a permanent national memorial will eventually be erected with a permanent professional staff. Until then, the volunteers of Shanksville will continue their work come snow, rain, or shine. These people telling you exactly what went on, how it happened, what the Shanksville Volunteer Fire Department, the EMSs, all the, you know, everything that went on. Uh, it's, it's, you need these kind of people. It's amazing. I think it's a good thing that they've done. They need to keep this and so everybody can be reminded that we're just not as quite as safe as we all thought we were. Congressman John Murtha, who represents the district where the plane crashed, said he will introduce legislation to instruct the Interior Department to plan finance and construct a suitable memorial for the victims. It's a sacred site. The coroner and the commissioners and the survivors have convinced me this is hallowed ground. So today I'm announcing legislation to establish a monument to the heroes of Flight 93. Residents of the small town of Shanksville, Pennsylvania were affected by the tragedy of 9-11 right in their backyard. And now those same residents are doing their part to help all those who were affected by 9-11. Mark Desvidakis, TV5 News. You hear it all the time. People say they're going to the rec center to work out. 
But what exactly do people do when they work out? I know I wanted to get in shape, but I didn't know exactly what to do at the rec center. So I sought help. Drew Wilburn is a personal trainer at Clarence University's rec center, and I had him design an average workout program for college students. So basically what we've come up with for today is a three day a week program, uh, each day incorporating full body workout. In other words, we're going to try and target all the major muscles in the body, um, from your biceps and your triceps and your arms, to a little bit of chest, some back uh, work, we're going to try and incorporate your legs as well, and we're also going to try and throw in some cardio work, workout as well. So we began with a cardio warm-up of 20 to 30 minutes. Um, really when it comes to cardio, it's really your choice. Um, <clears throat> there's the indoor track here, you can use that, you can go run outside. Um, there's the elliptical runners, we have stair masters, we have a rowing machine, we have stationary bikes. Uh, if you're someone who's not a big fan of cardio, which is someone like myself, uh, what I tend to t recommend to people is alternate. Maybe instead, if you're doing 30 minutes in one day, don't spend 30 minutes on one machine. Maybe spend 15 and 15 divided up between two machines, or you can even spend it between three machines, 10 minutes each. Okay. Um, After the warm-up, it was off to the weight room where we started with bench presses. You want to keep uh, your uh, it's just hips uh, and your rear pressed against this mat at all times. The shoulder blades must also be pressed against the mat at all times. Okay? Lower back, you notice you can slide a hand in this hips, that's fine. But your, your hips and your shoulder blades must be against the mat at all times. Why don't you use a grip of about shoulder width apart? You can use the range here to judge or where the grip begins. Okay? I usually like to put use, use my hands just inside the rings. Tall people longer on range, you can go just outside, whatever's comfortable for you. Basically what you're going to do is hand keep hands feet secure on the ground, those parts of your body pressing against the mat, lift the bar up to box, uh, mid chest. What you're going to do is slowly bring it down to right about the nipple line across your chest. Okay, right about where your sternum is. You don't want to drop right on your chest. Just slowly down, let it just touch. Using your arms and your back, press straight back up. Drew recommends three sets of 10 reps each for the bench presses. And he says to choose weights you're comfortable with, and then work up to heavier weights. Next, the lat pull down. What this is going to work, when we say uh, lats, we're talking about the muscles that reside right here down the side of your body, okay? What you're going to, you want to find a comfortable grip, something at least shoulder width apart, preferably a little bit wider. For my preference, I like to go extremely wide out to where, the, where you can see here where the bar curves. It's just, I find it's the most comfortable for me. What you're going to do then, have a seat in the apparatus. There's a leg catch here to keep your knees pressed against. Let your body hang here. Let it just, you know, don't try and start already in this motion. What I want you to do is keep your body at what we call a dead hang. Okay, just hold on to the bar. From this motion, keeping your back straight, Pull it to the front at the top of your chest. Keeping your elbows out, that focuses on the muscle groups you should be working with. Drew then showed me the low row. This is actually works across um, the upper back. You can, uh, depending on how you do it, work a little bit more of your lower back as well. Where I prefer, feet securely on the feet pad, legs almost locked out, but a slight bend in the knee. Okay. Make sure you have a nice firm grip. Pull it back to your chest is elevated and your back is straight. You don't want to start with your back with your shoulders rolled forward and your back curved. You want to try and get it chest up and flat back here. Again, letting the machine pull your arms straight. Now, again, having a nice firm grip, you're going to use your elbows, keep them in close. Pull your elbows back, pulling the grip into your stomach, and you basically want to try and pinch your shoulder blades together. Here's a review of the parts of the workout Drew Wilburn at the Clarence University Rec Center designed for us. First, he said we should spend 20 to 30 minutes on a cardio warm-up.
That could be anything from a walk outside to some time on the stationary bikes. Moving on to the weight room, Drew suggests doing the bench press at three sets of 10 reps each. The lat pull down should also be done for three sets of 10 reps each. And concluding with what we showed you yesterday, the low row should be done for three sets of 10 reps each. Now we'll move on to some more exercises in our program. We start today with the seated shoulder press. This is another exercise where I strongly suggest that you have a spot. There's a uh, standing plate that gives you spot as you stand, again, because this is something that is overhead. Starting off, again, grip about shoulder width apart, maybe a little bit more, depending upon what is comfortable for you. Notice there's these uh, pegs here across the floor. What you want to do is use those to push your hips, again, into the back of this. If you want to try and avoid getting your hips away from it, keep your hips and your shoulder blades pressed firmly against the seat back. Press up. This again is a mo uh, motion that comes in front of you, down to by your chest, and then up. Straight up above you. You always want to keep an eye on the bar as it comes down, keep your head up, looking up so you know where to press the bar up to. Drew talked about using a spotter while doing the shoulder press, but he thinks working out with someone else all the time is a good idea. Workout buddies are something I strongly, strongly recommend because it gives you someone to be accountable to. If it's just you, then, you know, let's say you like to get up and you decide, I'm going to get up in the morning first, a little bit early, go do my workout, and then go on with the rest of my day. If it's just you, and you hit that alarm in the morning, okay, you answer to you as to whether or not you're going in. Whereas if you know you're meeting someone here, you don't necessarily want to stand that person up, nor do they want to stand you up. Next, the standing barbell curls. Basically for this exercise, excuse me, grip, uh, underhand on the bar. Again, thumbs over or underneath, whichever your preference may be. Notice I just let my arms hang down. That's about how wide you're going to let the grip go. About elbow length, shoulder width, or now what you're going to do is use it to curl straight up, back down. The main thing to keep in mind for this exercise is to keep your uh, elbows isolated. In other words, don't move. You don't want to get this swinging motion. You want to keep your elbows pretty much in the same position. You want to make sure also that you come all the way down to, what they, again, what they call a dead hang. The tricep press down can be done using a variety of gripping apparatus, but Drew showed us the basics. Faith thing here again, isolation of those elbows. Okay? What works best for most people, feet pressing the feet together in your stance, um, knees slightly bent, little bit bent forward at your hips. Not necessarily rolling your back, just slight bend forward in, in your hips to get you look forward. Okay? Keep your elbows in one position. You want to let the machine pull you up as far as you can your arms up first without moving the elbow. You know what you're going to do? Press it down. That's it. Again, keeping, it, keeping the movement nice and slow and controlled. Keeping the elbows isolated. Tonight we finish our workout by showing you all of the exercises Drew Wilburn at the Clarion University Rec Center recommends for a three day a week full body workout. You should begin with 20 to 30 minutes of cardio exercise. They could be walking or using any variety of cardio equipment. After the cardio warm up, Drew recommends doing all of these exercises for three sets of 10 reps each. The bench press, the lat pull down, the low row, the seated shoulder press, the standing barbell curl, and the tricep press down. So we begin showing you the rest of the workout with an exercise most people have heard of but may not be doing properly, the squat. Basically, what I'm looking for here is a grip a little bit outside of my shoulders first. I'll make sure I get a nice tight grip on it first. Then what I'm going to do is walk up underneath the bar, keeping my hands where they're at, not allowing them to, do, not allowing them to move out. Pressing the bar against the top of my shoulders. The reason I keep my hands together is it makes a nice shelf by pinching my shoulder blades together for the 
the bar to rest upon, okay? Thus alleviating some of the pressure on you, okay? Lift, just stand up underneath to lift the bar up off the rack. Place your feet about, lift just outside shoulder width apart. Notice again, I'm keeping my hands pinched together, keep, keep my, or excuse me, my hands where they're at, pinching my shoulder blades together, which keeps the bar pressed into my back, okay? Now, the main thing here is you need to keep your head up. You don't want to get yourself bent over too far. The other thing that's important is you want to keep your weight in your heels rather than getting up on your toes. What I like to do is I basically just take my toes and curl them up towards the ceiling. Keeps the weight in my heels, helps prevent um, stre uh, unneeded stress on the knee. What you're going to do, squat down, your legs get almost parallel, and then stand back up. The next exercise is the standing calf raises, which can be done a couple of different ways. Find an elevated surface where you have something you can grab hold of for balance just in case you need, to, you need it. I want to go ahead and demonstrate with both feet together. Keep them together, placing the balls of your feet on the ledge. Let your heels stretch back to get a nice stretch across your calves, your hamstrings. Then simply push up with your toes as far and as high as you can. You want to hold that for approximately one second, one and one and a half seconds. Then slowly again, back down, getting a full stretch all the way down. You want to make sure in this exercise to get full range of motion all the way up, hold, all the way down, let it stretch back out. All the way up, and then all the way back down. If you're going to use the left utilize one at a time, you can either place one foot out in front of you or behind you, but it's still the same motion. All the way up, then all the way back down to the full stretch. Our final exercise are crunches. This is perhaps the most famous exercise out there. Basically what we're looking for is a padded surface. You, don't want, to, you want to try and avoid on the hard floor. Feet together, knees together, approximately about a 90 degree angle better than your knees. The main thing to remember on your crunches is you want to keep that lower back, this small part of your back, pressed into the mat at all times. You don't want to get this kind of rocking motion up, right? You want to keep this pressed in as much as possible. That isolates this area and does not add any undue stress to your back. A couple different ways are one is across your chest. Some people like to put their hands behind their head, to put their hands behind their ears. I recommend hands behind the ears because it adds a little more difficulty in your leverage, but it doesn't allow you to pull through with your arms. Okay? Sometimes if you, if you clasp your hands, put them behind your head, you'll see people doing this. And all they're doing is just moving their neck. They're not focusing here. The only thing you want to concentrate on is keeping your upper back and your neck and your head all in one position so that your body moves as a board rather than curling. So if you're in this, from here, laying flat on the mat, keeping your lower back pressed in, you're going to curl up, hold, and then slowly lower back down. 